The Impossible Poet, a medical autobiography by Ashafen. Trigger and content warnings. Interlude about Aunt Sissy. To this day, I do not know what happened to Aunt Sissy. When she died, or how she came to be in the state she endured for so many decades. One of the great aunts and grandma, the most consistent things I heard were that she read too many books, was too smart for her own good, and caught a fever in her brain thing, and that made her a vegetable for the rest of her life. She became a warning to me as I looked so much like her and had a penchant for the words. I found out she existed when I was 10 or so, the oldest daughter apparently, and had been in college about to graduate when something happened. Grandma and Aunt Ruth vagued it. illness, meningitis, lobotomy. My mother asked, who could know? In the 70s, Sissy was in her 90s. Doesn't have a wrinkle on her goddamn face, Grandma would mutter as she was packing up another bag full of red Valentine's Day products bought on the 15th of February. They talked about how in the nursing home, Sissy was just so happy, a joy to the ward. Everyone loved her. And it was as though she couldn't remember who she was before the brain damage, as though nothing mattered but that moment's encounter with pudding. One thing bothers her. Grandma told Mama with a smile that chilled my bones as she gave the bag to Ruth and told her to go to the car. She is absolutely terrified of the color red. So we collected for her, Ruth called out over her shoulder, slow as everything else she did. That way, we can make her feel something for a while. She starts screaming. She hides in the closet. And we festoon the room with red pillows, red hearts, red balloons. Smiling again, Grandma felt such a thrill as they were leaving. I love to make sure she's screaming, pissing, and shitting herself with terror. So for a few days, she'll at least know she was alive. Mama and I stay quiet after they left, driven to the nursing home by my oblivious father, returning after an hour or so, utterly contented with their work. Oh, she knows she's alive now. We asked about Sissy, but they blew our questions off again and again until she was dead. Ruth followed right after her, being called Sarah Turner, the first name she never used, and the surname of the man whose abuse was so bad that every time she mentioned his name, she spat. Until then, I hadn't even known she'd taken his name. He was just Mr. Turner. Sissy and her red balloons did not come up again for many years. I never got to meet her. She was gone before I could drive. When my grandmother died, one of two great aunts I had been interrogating for information about my biological grandfather took a moment to pause and she brought out a picture. You are just like Sissy, she motioned to the other great aunt. Doesn't she look like her? She moved a curl off my shoulder and stared at it for a while. She had that same strawberry blonde hair, same curls. She was quick like you too. Such a shame what happened to her. You know, if you read too many books, my dear, you'll end up like that too. 
Before I could say anything, she went on to tell me yet another implausible version of my mother's conception. <sighs> As I have written this book, Love, I wonder why I am not more bitter. And I do struggle with the emotion. But maybe because I ran away from people <coughs> who would torture someone already so horribly injured with color for the crime of being happy inside her life as it was. Oh, that was a gift I gave myself. Perhaps I am also not more bitter because I cherish the thought that once they returned, Aunt Ruth told me, for I was apoplectic with rage, that Sissy was true and real and they did what they did, as only a righteous ten-year-old could be. The staff who adored this lonely delight of an elder would race to rip everything off the walls and pull the red blankets off of her lap while Sissy was screaming and trying to hide in the closet. What appalling hatred to have to do that to your own sister. How unbelievably harsh they must have seen their own lives being compelled to begrudge someone shattered their peace. This is why I left my family when I did. We were moving so many states away, I thought, with the intention of adopting or having a family. I mean, we'd been trying for years. I couldn't raise a child among that kind of family. Oh, sweet love, I wound up finding this steady, firm foundation of loving each breath. And it is as shocking as it is glorious. And thankfully, I'm not afraid of any color. But I find myself among people who think my joy is ghastly and my practice is madness. I wonder what their damage is that they cannot see me, that they cannot believe me when I say that I create enough love to sustain myself. Why did the therapist laugh at that? Why could she not see it's hard work? The three women closest to me and my family were horrible to the people around them, but they were also bitches to the rules and standard imposed upon them by society and then by their own cruelty. Before that first suicide attempt at nine, when my mother was exhorating me for not knowing that two spaces went after every period and said for the 10,000th time, I would not be able to live if I were you. She was fucking trapped inside a world where any imperfection or ignorance rendered anyone and everyone automatically less than. She preferred to believe, for we had this conversation a few times, that my grandmother was raped by a stranger rather than what the auntie said, which is that she fell deeply in love with someone who had the misfortune of being black. <laughs> for you can be the parent of a biracial child and still be a raging racist she hated me so much mama would say driving back from the funeral it had to be against her will but she would always scream at you that it was your fault because you were the reason she got caught <sighs> just to let you know I can still drive while being slapped. This is a skill once acquired, never lost. <laughs> the 
the ones that argued, I should want to die. I wonder what they would have done if, like Aunt Sissy, I had just ceased to be able to articulate in defense of myself. Would they festoon my room with red? It feels like I am being punished for having a capacity for joy. The way no one will treat the pain or believe that it exists. But I also know that inside this agony and with the burdens of abuse and mental illness I shoulder, I will feel like I am on the outside no matter what happens. Giving those who claim to love you all the information in the world about what you want and what you do not want in case of impairment won't matter one shit when they don't respect you enough to believe you or to think that you know what's best for your own damn life. And now I know this extends beyond just family, but to those I thought were friends. Love isolation's better. Without my full strength of wit and will, I cannot fight for my freedom again when I am being told that wanting to live makes me insane. What can I do when those exercising power over me do not see me as real enough to even have an opinion that matters. Still, be careful. You may wake up to red balloons on your birthday every day for 70 years. That is what causes so much bitterness in me. During moments like this weekend, CR wishing me luck with this new debilitating agony below my ribs. Why the poet keeps stomping her feet in outrage at those former friends so long after the event. Thankfully, I can come here to the altar of art laying my soul open onto the page. <coughs> <coughs> And I can realize this is what heals me and what transforms this existence they see as misery into a good life. This weekend, although the word friend is so loaded, one took me to get groceries and stabbies for my insulin. Maybe it was overdoing it shopping that left me in agony later, but I would have been on the floor that night screaming regardless in all likelihood. As we talked, I got a chance to give this analogy to someone else who could deeply understand it given our mutual love of music. Without time, there would be no music at all. Without progression, Without some form of a beat, everything that overlays and intertwines with it, we could not have story or song. If I adore how I am right now in this moment and I am besotted with this breath, then I can't begrudge what has come before the beauty of this note is because of the context in which it occurs. Now for me, when I flow like I have been, the love that fills me with this immediacy of word to the neurons firing, when all else falls away and I am nothing but the delight that we have this language that connects us, even when I am housebound and overwhelmed with bodily woe. All the bitterness gets swept away into the forgiveness that flows through me. And I still don't get why they did it.
the impacts of their actions continue to reverberate in my interactions with ERs and doctors. But I pour love like honey over the version of me that was ready to shit on their lawn after getting released from the hospital, but didn't. Good poet. They didn't deserve the fertilizer. But that on its own is enough for me to know I really have to be vigilant about the bitterness. It's a sign I'm believing the madness that I am somehow less than the glorious drunk lover pounding letters onto the screen before me. Like this act of steadfast self-love will have an impact somewhere else. And even if it doesn't, love is its own reward. Being here in the embrace of story and painting and talking to all the faces I doodle so they will tell me their stories. I know I am inside my own imagination, filling up with love that I am creating and filling hope up with fuel enough to get through the times when solitude becomes isolation. And I know that I am on my own inside this journey. My gratitude for what I can change, mediums that I have at my disposal to suit body and mind's abilities, whatever they happen to be in the moment, is endless. That I have time to explore the ways in which I am like my ancestors and how I reject them. This fills me as I run out of words. Aunt Sissy, I would have covered you in blue or green or whatever color made you smile. And I would have wrapped your joy in protection because even if I had never known you at your prime, I would have treasured your happiness because I would have seen it as a miracle to find peace after whatever illness or injury you suffered. And yet I am so afraid that had you stayed healthy and strong, there would have been four women in the window judging a woman in a wheelchair, full of outer vestiges of meaning, children, a husband that was devoted to her, but who was still not worth living. Stoned as I am, I imagine that there would just be one more voice amid this Greek choir of ancestors, all angry and outraged at the state of my house, and that my reaction to their anger is to smoke another bowl. I give thanks to every deity I can think of, that I am alone and living in my loving, rather than that kind of social agony. And I move from language to how shadow and light play with each other painting. May I keep practicing myself away from the bitterness and the judgment that fuels it. But I appreciate you listening. And I thank you.